Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for uh, just help, uh, just for allowing us to come together again, uh, Lord, to uh, learn more about uh, the, the book of Revelation. Lord, we pray you'll be with Mike as he brings our uh, brings the uh, uh, study to us, Lord, and I just pray that you will, through him, will help us to uh, uh, be able to absorb this, Lord, and to be able to respond and and to have an interactive meeting, Lord. And Lord, we just, uh, again, thank you. And Lord, we just pray that you'll bless this time. Lord, we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, we'll see how much of the first 10 verses we can get through on the anti on the, the beast. And we'll also be, oh, there's Deepak. And we'll also be... Uh, oh, Galaxy Tab, is that Phil? Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I started recording. Yeah. Yeah, that may be. Nick is here as well. A Galaxy tab may be, may be, or maybe that's Alex. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Uh, so anyway, um, I'm pretty certain we will not get past verse 10 tonight. Uh, remember the Revelation 13 is divided in two parts. First 10 verses. Uh, um uh, are about the beast from the sea, and then verse, in the last uh, eight verses, uh, verses 11 through 18, are about the beast from the land. So um, I, what I will do is I will read these first 10 verses, and then we'll get started. All righty. Uh, Revelation 13, uh, starting verse 1. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blasphemies, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Okay, let's let's stop there and let's go through these verses. We started last week. We got through the first couple of verses, but I, I want to just review them and, and ask a question uh, on these first couple of verses. What, uh, what we see is uh, um, John saw a beast riding out of this, rising out of the sea. And the context here, remember, is in chapter 12, uh, Satan got cast down from heaven, disbarred from being able to accuse the saints before God in heaven. And he uh, um, initiate or, or pursued his war against uh, the people of God, and that chapter ended with the dragon, who is Satan, standing on the seashore. 
And so then chapter 13 opens up uh, with a beast rising out of the sea. John sees this. So obviously the implication there between the, the last sentence of chapter 12 and this first sentence of chapter 13 was that the dragon was calling uh, this ally. Was uh, <clears throat> Anyway, John said that he saw a beast rising out of the sea. And remember we said that in Old Testament thought, the sea represents evil and chaos. So out of the evil and chaos that's, uh, uh, that dominates the world, the dragon, Satan, was calling an ally to uh, use in his war against the saints. That's the picture that we have here. And um, we're told that the beast rising out of the sea, uh, he, he saw it the, was with 10 horns and seven heads with 10 diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And uh, to it, the dragon gave uh, his power and his throne and his great authority. So, uh, um, this, this is God, this is John's creative reworking of Daniel's vision, okay? Um, and we, we looked at Daniel's vision in chapter seven last week, the first seven verses. Remember that uh, Daniel's four beasts were successive empires, the the uh, the lion was the first beast, and it represented Babylon. The bear was the second beast out of the sea in Daniel 7, and it represented Media Persia. Um, the leopard was the third beast, and it represented Greece. And then uh, the beast was 10 with 10 horns. That's the fourth beast uh, that represented Rome. It's kind of interesting here in the first two verses of Revelation 13 that, that uh, um, John makes a reference, uh, an allusion to all four of those beasts, but he does it in reverse order. In Daniel, the order was lion, bear, leopard, beast with 10 horns. Here in, in John, these first, in uh, Revelation 13, these first two verses, it's beast with 10 horns, uh, and it was like a leopard, its feet was like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. So it went uh, beast with horns, uh, leopard, bear, lion. Don't know why he reversed the order from Daniel's uh, vision. Uh, I haven't read anybody that comments on that, but my guess is, is because um, uh, he's looking at Rome uh, as the then current manifestation of the beast in his day, John was. So that that's why he started with the beast in, in Daniel's vision that represented Rome. And then just, anyway, that's just conjecture. That's, uh, that's free. Um, but the important thing here is that John saw, because he incorporated elements of all four of Daniel's beasts, John saw his sea beast as a composite of Daniel's four beasts, okay? And so here's the question I want you to ponder. What's the point of that? What did John intend for us to understand uh, from this composite beast? The fact that he combined uh, all four Daniel's beast into his one sea beast. What do you think might be uh, his intent uh, for us to draw from that? Understand the question, or did I ask it too weird? 
Say, ask it again. Um, in the first two verses of Revelation 13, yeah, John creatively reworks Daniel's vision of the four beasts in Daniel 7. The first was a lion, second was bear, third was leopard, fourth was beast with ten horns. Well, John, in Revelation 13, 1 and 2, incorporates features of all four of those beasts in the beast that he saw, the sea beast that he saw in Revelation 13. And so the question is, what, what was John trying to convey to us by combining features of all four of Daniel's beasts into his one beast. There's always going to be a beast. <laughs> <laughs> it was a beast of a question, and that was a beast of an answer. <laughs> Be beautiful. <laughs> Jonathan. <laughs> there's always got to be a beast. That's good. That's good. But there's always going to be a beast. I mean, we're yes. always going to be facing a beast. I mean, he's that's thinking, true. No, that's true. you know, history. Well, he started uh, with the most current thing. Uh, Daniel went the other way. And e either way, um, here's what's currently the beast. The next beast, you know, I don't, I think the question ought to be, what's the next beast going to look like? And it's here. What does it look like? Okay, yes, and we will get to that question, by the way. Oh, really? Oh, yes, okay. We yes, we will. Uh, but I think what John is trying to convey to us is that this beast that is the ally of the dragon uh, embodies all the evil characteristics of Daniel's four kingdoms. It embodies all the evil characteristics of those four kingdoms in one beast who Satan uses as his ally to war against the church. So it's a picture of what we're up against, okay? One heck of a beast. Yes, exactly. That's right. Okay. So anyway, the... Then we saw that the beast also resembles the dragon. And, and we talked about last week that the most likely reason uh, for portraying the beast as similar to the dragon is to, to picture the fact that the dragon has given all of his uh, power and authority and throne to the sea beast to the dragon's beast how did the dragon get such authority and power because it says not it, it uses the word authority doesn't it yeah you're talking about in verse two well i'm fussing around here i just remember reading it during the week that the, the authority i think it's I, it's right down here on the bottom of my page of my Bible, but I, I can't use my Bible because my um, Zoom won't work on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> it's right at the bottom of the page. Though. Oh, okay. he, he, he gives him power. Well, uh, the reason I asked no. which passage you're referring to is because later on we're going to see in verses five through seven, the authority of the beast comes up, the issue of the authority of the beast comes up again. But we're going to. The gonna, beast or the dragon? Uh, well, well yeah, it would be both. Two, what he's talking about. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Right. So where did. Yeah. The dragon gave that to the beast. Uh, right. Where does the dragon get. It, look, it looks like. I think I remember reading that, that the dragon gives authority to all these beasts sounded like they were the, he was the kingpin and they were the less rings i don't know well but yes. i think well, it, that's uh, 
Do you remember right. uh, Satan is called the prince of the power of the air, right? Ephesians chapter two. Uh, do you remember Jesus in his temptations in the wilderness? Uh, at least uh, the temptation that Matthew presents as the third temptation uh, is uh, Satan takes him to uh, to a high point yes. and shows him all these kingdoms and says, I will give them to you if you bow down and worship me. And uh, no, Jesus shoes him away. Um, he said, Jesus says, be gone, Satan. Uh, you shall worship the Lord your God and only. And, and only him. Um, but so the clearly, verse, Jesus yeah. did not, in that temptation, Jesus did not contest the fact that Satan could give him these kingdoms. Ooh. And, remember that? <laughs> So, yeah, I remember the temptation. Yeah, oh, okay. I wasn't there, but it was terrible. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, what have what have all you guys been eating today? Man, yeah. We are lively tonight. <laughs> I got some. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. Uh, but it does say give power and his throne and great authority. That's yes. what Pam read. Right. And so what I'm saying is that sounds an awful like an awful lot what Satan offered Christ uh, in the wilderness in his temptation, right? So yeah. he had it to give in certain ah, measure. I see. In certain so, measure. Now we're gonna look, we're gonna see later on in verses five through seven, that no matter the fact that the beast was given all this authority and power and throne from Satan, still uh, God's sovereignty rules over them all. We're going to see that in verses five through seven. So no matter how much uh, authority Satan has in, in the short time he has left on earth, it is a circumscribed authority. It is not an unlimited authority. Uh, um, he's, he's only allowed uh, to do um, what God, uh, he can only do what God allows him to do. That's true with Satan. That's true with the beast. And we're going to see that in verses five through seven, when we get down there. So is the dragon Satan? Yes, the dragon is Satan. Got it. Okay, just want to make sure. Yes, yes, the dragon is a symbol for Satan. Okay. So we keep the bad guys straight here. Yes. <laughs> one of the one of the things that we can be assured is since. Um, Satan gave to the beast all his authority and power and uh, throne is that the beast's oppression is demonic. The beast's, uh, any kind of rule that he exercises, any kind of authority and power he exercises will be demonic. Be demonically inspired and influenced because he gets his authority and power and throne from the dragon, from Satan. So we're talking about something that's satanically backed, okay? Yeah. When we talk about the beast. Uh, all right. Now, here's the $50,000 question that we started on last week. But we didn't really get we didn't really get to um, touch upon these these next three questions I asked. Is the beast the Antichrist? Is the beast a person or a system? Uh, and um, will there be a final manifestation of the beast? in a single human figure at the close of history? Those are the questions that everybody's 
want to ask about about the beast and so we're here now we're at this point we're going to go through this okay um some of this i touched upon a little bit uh last week but none of it was written down in your notes um so this first question is the beast the antichrist is it appropriate to call the beast the antichrist so the interesting thing uh about the book of revelation is in a lot of popular treatments when we get to the book of revelation people want to talk about the antichrist the the plain fact of the matter is that nowhere in the book of revelation is the beast ever called antichrist as a matter of fact the term antichrist only appears in the new testament five times and that's in john's letters i don't know what phil's doing uh first john oh, i'm just i'm i'm listening i can't hold my phone up yeah that's fine you're gonna just have to do without my beautiful face yeah we're well we're listening too um okay. uh so I thought I saw that that the false prophet was mentioned in here too. That's verses eleven through eighteen. Okay. First things first. <laughs> All right. Let's let's let's. Isn't the dragon the antichrist? The dragon is Satan. Well, yeah, yeah, I understand. And so, isn't he the antichrist? No, the antichrist is his ally. If it's, um, what I'm going to argue is that it's, it, it is appropriate to refer to the beast as Antichrist if we understand and keep in mind what the New Testament, John in particular, teaches about Antichrist. Okay. What we're getting at, I'm going to go through these, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going through these three questions. Uh, because we want to get to the we want to get to the point where we identify who the beast is. Okay, so we're taking it one step at a time. So first of all, is it appropriate to call the beast antichrist? And the reason that question comes up is because the Book of Revelation never calls the beast antichrist as a matter of fact that term antichrist is never found in the book is not found in the book of revelation it is only found five times in john's letters now of course john wrote revelation but he didn't use the term antichrist in the in revelation to refer to the beast however john did talk about antichrist in 1st John 2 and 1st John 4 and in 2nd John and so that's what we want to look at uh, to answer this question is it appropriate to call the beast antichrist uh, so 1st John 2 18 let's let's just go to 1st John 2 <clears throat> Verse 18, and he, and he writes, and he writes, children, it is the last hour, as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. So clearly what John is saying to these believers uh, is that these first century believers were told uh, um, that Antichrist is coming. And he says, 
uh, that now many at that time many antichrists have come and so because of that they know they're in the last hour all right what verse was that in in first john 2 18 verse 18 hey phil yo um i have a question are you yes. flipping through pages or are you eating crackers <laughs> <laughs> I'm flipping them the most wonderful pages to hold here today. I'll well, try to be quieter. You, know? <laughs> you remember in the old days, pastors used to say, I love to hear the sound of the pages turning in the Bible. <laughs> they weren't yes. on Zoom. It's, it, they weren't on Zoom. That's right. <laughs> yeah. No, my pages on my phone are like this. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Your rubber band is quieter. <laughs> yeah, I, I've got it on my wrist, but uh, <laughs> no, I think I'm okay with what I've said. Okay. Okay. So, first John 2 18, they knew they were in the last hour because of the existence of many antichrists. Okay. Then, uh the so antichrist is used two times there in this verse in verse 18 the other three uses are found in verse 22 of this chapter and then in in 4 3 and then second john 7 and there and those three verses uh let's just read them real quickly and i'll sum them up verse 22 who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, this is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. Notice, to deny that Jesus is the Christ is to deny the Father and the Son. We'll comment on that a little bit later. And then over in chapter 4, verse 3, um, John, uh, you know, he says, uh, don't believe every spirit, test the spirits. Uh, and uh, he, he says, uh, verse two, by this, you know, the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Now, verse three, this is the verse we want. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Very similar to what he said in verses 18 and 22 in chapter two. Then you flip over to 2 John verse seven. And he says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Okay. So you put those three verses together and what we can say, what John is teaching them is that whoever denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh thereby denying the Father and the Son, is a liar and a deceiver and the Antichrist. Okay, so let me ask you this. Um, based on John's teaching that we just went over, uh, based on his teaching about Antichrist, how would you answer this question? Who or what who and or what is antichrist everybody who's not a believer well um it's even more specific than that you mean the political figure on no i'm i'm talking specifically of what john said notice again uh um uh, the summary there of uh, 1 John 2, 22, 4, 3, and 2 John 7. Whoever denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh 
is a liar and a deceiver and the Antichrist. And really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I can see we're going to have to edit this Zoom session. <laughs> Rubber band, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> I, I'm muting myself. <laughs> so who and or what is Antichrist? I think what John is intending us, the way John is intending us to answer this question is um, whoever denies the incarnation of the son of God. Mm. Let me say it a little bit stronger. Whoever denies that the man Jesus and the eternal son of God are the one, are one and the same person. Whoever denies that, that the man Jesus and the eternal son of God are one and the same person is Antichrist. So uh, the spirit of Antichrist is a theological lie. And that theological lie is the man Jesus and the eternal son of God are not one and the same person. That's a theological lie that John addresses in these two letters and calls the spirit of Antichrist. And whoever, whoever promotes that lie, whoever promulgates that lie, is Antichrist. And he says, even by the time, by near the, uh, by the time that John wrote these two letters, he says there's already been many Antichrists that have come. Okay. So, um, is that, there anybody in history that would be a candidate for that? Well, in John's Hitler. day, there were lots. <laughs> yeah. uh, and there's been lots ever since. So, anybody that denies uh, the incarnation of the eternal son, which um, uh, near, close back to John's day, there was Sibelius. Uh, um, a little bit later, there is Arius, the Arian heresy, um, that, that Christ, that Jesus is not equal to the father, that he's a little created God. Notice that, he, that John says that when you deny the Father and the that when you deny the incarnation, you deny the Father and the Son. And yes. uh, in verse 22, uh, 23 of 1 John 2, uh, he, he says, whoever denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh does not have the Father. Um. In John 15, 23, and 24, Jesus says, those who hate me hate the Father. Those who receive me receive the Father. He doesn't say that in, in John 15, 23 through 24, but he does say that in other places. Those who receive me receive the Father. So, so to deny the incarnation is to reject who Christ is, which is to reject the Father as well. Uh, so this is the cornerstone of, of um, the spirit of Antichrist. This is the very essence of the spirit of Antichrist, denying the Father and Son by denying the incarnation. Okay? So does that spirit, is it appropriate to identify the beast with that spirit. I think it is. Uh, uh, obviously, in the Gospels, 
uh, the demons knew who Christ was, right? Um, we see that many times, uh, that they knew right away who Christ was, but they still reject Christ. They still reject the Father and the Son. Uh, so let me answer, ask, let's address this next question. So keep in mind, that's what John teaches about Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist is that theological lie that denies the incarnation, that denies the man Jesus is one and the same person, that the man Jesus and the eternal son of God are one and the same person. Um, the spirit of Antichrist denies that. It's a theological lie. And whoever promulgates that, whoever promotes that, is Antichrist. Okay. Let's... Are you turning back to Revelation 13, Phil? Yeah. Uh, so... No, I thought I muted it. I didn't. <laughs> I'm still um... rustling. So now in Revelation 13, as we have seen it, uh, John seems to portray the beast as a system, political, social, economic, and religious, right? In John's day, the way he's portraying the beast is the Roman Empire. That's what we've seen in the book of Revelation. It, um, and so John seems to be portraying the beast as a system, a political system, a social system, economic and religious. We'll, we'll see the economic and religious part uh, uh, in verses 11 through 18. Well, we even see the religious part here. Uh, they all worship the beast. Um, so it seems to be a system that opposes uh, the, um, the people of God, the oppose Christ and the people of God. Now, of course, you know, there's figures that head up systems, right? Like emperors uh, head up uh, 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 empires and the emperor at the time john wrote revelation the roman emperor was domitian and he has revived and he revived and we're at the end of domitian's reign near the end of domitian's right and uh reign in uh revelation he when he became emperor he revived um uh persecuting uh believers uh and we see it most in Rome and in Asia Minor. Uh, and remember those seven churches in chapter two and three were seven of the 10 churches in Asia Minor. Um, so anyway, John in Revelation 13, just on the surface, it appears that he's portraying the beast as a system, not as an individual person. Okay? He's looking at the... Uh, he's explaining why the church, why the Roman Empire is persecuting the church. And um, then we saw in th that in his letters, first and second John, John treated Antichrist as a heresy or a theological lie, as well as the persons who promote that lie. Okay, now we're getting to an answer here. I'm just let, laying these layers out here for you. I want you to keep these things in mind. We need to be clear about what's being, what, what John is doing here. Uh, Antichrist is treated as um, a heresy or a theological lie and the persons who promote that lie. In Revelation 13, the beast appears to be treated like a system, political, social, economic, and religious. There's one other factor we need to, that we need to bring in here before we finally 
get to uh, my definition of the beast, okay? And, and that is uh, the duration of the beast's reign uh, was said to be 42 months. Revelation 13, 5 says the beast was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. And notice in, in verses uh, 5, 6, and 7, that authority, that authority, so in verse 5, uh, second half of it, uh, beast was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. And notice in verses 6 and 7, uh, that authority was um, extended to blaspheming God, conquering God's people, and dominating all unbelieving earth dwellers. See that in verses 6, 7, and 8. So, um, and we've seen earlier in our time in Revelation that 42 months is used as a symbol. 42 months, 1,260 days, time, times, and half a time is used as a symbol to represent the suffering of the, of the people of God. And so... Um, we're told that the beast is going is given authority to blaspheme God, oppose God, blaspheme God, and conquer his people for 42 months. And we've seen that that symbol is used of the whole time between Christ's first and second coming, from his ascension to his second coming, that whole church age between his first and second coming is referred to as 42 months or 1,260 days or time, times, and half a time, the tribulation. And so we're told the beast is given authority to oppose God and his people during that entire time. So clearly, the beast cannot refer only to a single political system or person. Are you following? Are you picking up what I'm laying down here? If, if these 42 months refers to the whole time, between Christ's two comings, his first and second coming, and if the beast has been given authority to oppose God and his people for that entire time, then the beast can't be one sing referring to one single uh, political entity or to one single person. Does that make sense? If that's true, that entity or person would be 2,100 years right now, or 2,000 years old right now, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so what is the beast? You flip over to page three in the notes, and here we come to my understanding of the beast. And it's not mine only. Many people hold to this. Many um, interpreters. Well, since it's my view, I could say many scholars. Yeah. Uh, but no, many interpreters hold to this view, viewing the same uh, uh, Bible teaching that we just looked at from John's epistles, first and second. John and from Revelation 13 and other data, uh, other teachings. Um, uh, they came, there's many of us that come to this conclusion that the beast, uh, it's best to see the beast as a symbol 
for all satanically inspired opposition to Jesus and his people. That, that's both individual and collective opposition. It's, but it's all satanically inspired. Here's another way of saying it. Here's another way of, of, of looking at it. The beast is anything and everything. A person, a principle, a power that is utilized by the devil to deceive and to and destroy the influence and the advance of the kingdom of God. In John's day, that was being manifested through the Roman Empire. Another, yeah. another, another guy, Alan Johnson, uh, explained it this way, a little bit shorter. Uh, the beast is a Satan-backed system of deception and idolatry which may at any time express itself in human systems of various kinds, like the Roman Empire. Okay? okay let's just stop there. Let, let me say this. Because if, if we understand the beast this way, then it's quite appropriate to refer to the beast as Antichrist. Okay. Now, just to kind of make this a little bit more concrete, uh, and this we may not get any further than this. <laughs> just to make this a little bit more concrete, let me ask you: Is there? Can you think of a modern day how the how how the beast? is manifesting itself in our times. Think of what the beast does. What, what, just, just throw out examples of how the beast is manifesting itself in our times. Well, if you put... Go ahead, Jonathan. Wait a minute, wait a minute. No, 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 you go. Uh, wait a minute, Julie, what did you say? I said through television. Well, through television, but but specifically what on TV? The um, Clearly, it wouldn't be watching John MacArthur preach sermons no, on the no, television. I, I'm talking about like, the, uh, you know how programs are like uh, uh, America's Got Talent, sometimes they have uh, magic in there. Oh, magic, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And did you say false teaching? False teaching? Yep. Jonathan. I was thinking that the missionaries are up against this all the time. I mean, uh, they're introducing the Christ and, uh, and people are killing our missionaries for saying, for teaching that so i would say i would call them the antichrist or an antichrist yeah uh yes if they if what they are doing yes yes in a to a certain degree yes here's the way to think of it here's the way to th th uh think of it how is how is Satan deceiving and destroying the influence and advance of the kingdom of God today? And just to be specific, let's put specifics on it. Um, I would say um, through this uh, progressive ideology, Mm -hmm. which rejects the way God has ordered his creation. They re, um, they, uh, that this is why they are going after 
the church. This is why they're going after our kids in, in the school system is that they actively oppose uh, the biblical world view, the way God has created the world. They want to stop the influence of that in its tracks. They want to eliminate that influence. Um, Are they masquerading? Uh, Jan asked, uh, are they masquerading? Uh, yes, they, um, the way they, because deception, Satan yes. uses deception in lies. And, and the, and when you look at this progressive ideology that's, that's, uh, uh, throughout not only this country, but the world, but, but you can see it in the Western world, very very um aggressive and um i don't know what all adge adge adjectives to apply to it but they what stops them from accomplishing the goals they want is people holding to a biblical worldview and ordering our lives according to a biblical worldview. God created man in his own image. He created a male and female. The family is the basic unit of society. Um, and, and just on and on from there. Uh, the basic biblical worldview. In order to... Um, accomplish their ends uh, they have to turn over they have to get rid of this biblical world view and that's why uh, you see um, churches and Christian organizations pastors and churches being attacked over and over and over again. Um, that, is, that is an example of how Satan is going, is trying to, to uh, destroy the influence and advance of the kingdom of God. He is using uh, um, the educational system he's using political systems he's using religious systems um to accomplish that end like uh, banning prayer in school yes yeah exactly yeah ending prayer in school mm -hmm. so um uh you can see that this whole idea that this, this new definition of self, um, uh, I am, uh, what's, the, what's the essence of who I am is how I feel and what desires I have. And I'm not free unless I'm allowed to express them the way that I want to express them. Satan is using that uh in academia he's used it in academia to spread it into uh the teaching industry into politics into religion uh, uh to overturn the biblical worldview to deceive people to reject the biblical worldview and to embrace uh, this ideology uh, and in order to, to do two things, to destroy in the influence and advance of the kingdom and to get people to worship him.
Okay. So um, that's just one example of, of what I believe John is calling the beast. It is a, a satanic back system of deception and idolatry. Satan will use anything, a person, a principle, a power, a political entity, uh, a religion. He'll use anything to through to use de deception to destroy the advance of God's kingdom and to get people to worship him. So the beast is a system that Satan uses. Okay. And we can see how we can see how that would last as long as Satan is allowed to war against God and his people. Rome and Nero didn't last 2,000 years, but Satan's battle against uh, God and his people does. Yes. So, so that's why at any given time, for instance, the reformers during their time, they identified the Catholic Church and the Pope as the Antichrist. Well, again, that's an example of Satan using a system, this time a religious system, to, uh, to destroy uh, the um, influence and advance of the kingdom of God. So God raises up. Uh, all these reformers and recovers the gospel. Uh, um, so you can, you can, that's, that's why almost anybody's lifetime, they can point to such and such a thing and say, that must be the antichrist. That must be the beast is because the beast um is a Satan-backed system of deception and idolatry uh, that he uses to oppose God and his people. And he'll, he'll use anything, a person, a principle, a power, an ideology. And where better, start, where better to start than with the youth in five years old and... and School told you, you, yeah. you feel like a woman today. That's okay. Yeah. Tomorrow yeah. be different. Yeah. Or whatever they teach them. But it's, it's this den gender dysphoria and it's crazy. And, you know, a generation ago, Mike, you can underscore this too, is this would have been just laughed at. Yeah. Now, you better not laugh. Yeah. You yes. can be in trouble for saying God created men, male and female. Yes, yes, exactly. So the reason I wanted to take time to go over this is because me and I'm sure several of you grew up thinking of the Antichrist and the beast as a person. And formally, I thought it's a person that's going to come at the close of history and do all these terrible things well that question is still open notice that the very we're not going to get to it tonight but notice that the that the very next question is will the different manifestations of the beast or antichrist assume the form of a single human figure at the close of history and uh I think it will, but I don't get that from Revelation 13 necessarily. I get that from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, the man of lawlessness. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about that next week. But it might take some time for you to adjust your thinking to seeing uh, the beast 
as a satanic back system of deception and idolatry. Uh, just think in this terms that what John is explaining uh, is um, why the church after Christ died, remember the promised one, he was promised all those centuries in the Old Testament, ever since the fall, starting at the fall, the seed, the promised seed in Genesis 3.15, all of those promises, uh, uh, the promised one finally came and he went to the cross and he defeated Satan he can and death, and he canceled our 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 sin at the cross. And so the question arises, and and he and he uh, rose again from the dead, went to heaven, uh, sat on his throne. And so the question arises: So why are we, his people, being suffering so much from? this defeated foe and and why is the whole world turning on us and the book of revelation is john's answer to that question um we're almost home but we're not quite home um we haven't received we've received much of our salvation but not all of it we still have glory to come. And meanwhile, in this time between Christ's two comings, this is the church's wilderness. We're protected by God, but we are exposed to the onslaughts of Satan. And he is using everything and anything to go after God's people. Uh, and to to destroy the influence and advance of God's kingdom and his chief tools is deception and idolatry so the beast is any system he uses to do that okay and so when you start thinking about it in this term one of the things it does is it shows you it, you start being able to identify, oh, yes, I can see how Satan, even though we don't see Satan, even though he's behind the scenes, I can see how Satan is aggressively going after uh, the people of God, opposing God and his kingdom. So I wanted to take the time to go through all of that uh, just to adjust our thinking here. Yes, he will use a person. He does use persons. You know, Nero, Domitian. But the beast isn't, isn't Nero and Domitian. The beast isn't just the Roman Empire. It's, it's Hitler. It's, it's this, the stuff we're talking about tonight. This, this uh, new ideology and the progressive philosophy and ideology that's that's got the world in its grip he's using that to uh to destroy the influence and advance of god's kingdom he thinks that if he can kick biblical worldview um out of existence that he can stop the advancement of the kingdom of god but he can't He's a defeated foe. And so our job is just to keep proclaiming Christ and endure what God allows, endure the persecution, what God allows in our life and remain faithful to him. That in a nutshell is the book of Revelation. And if you have it up here, like Dr. Fox says, if you remember it, if you have it up here, then you have it in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so it's it it is uh, time for us to stop. What I want to do. It, my son, right? <laughs> oh. I'm going to stop the recording I and then I'm, <laughs> I'm going to stop the recording and then and uh, I'm going to ask um, Joe to close us in prayer. Then I'll stop the recording and then we can talk we can ask questions and bounce around ideas and all of that. OK, Joe. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we've had this evening to um, study your word. Thank you, Father, for um, giving us understanding and giving us even more questions to ask to dig deeper. I pray, Father, that you would help us to put the pieces together in a way that um, would bring glory to you and that we would have truth and understanding. Father, I, um, I just thank you, Father, for your love and for your word and for your blessings um, on our church family. I thank you again for this morning and what a blessing it was to all of us who were able to be there. We pray that you would go with us throughout the remainder as we um, enter into this week. Father, I pray that you would just go with us and help us, Father, to, to have um, you and your will on our hearts and on our minds and to seek after you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay. Hey guys, I'm going to go ahead and, and leave you now. I love you all. Thank you.